All right, uh, so I think we'll start off with uh, the last talk for today, uh, which is another medalist presentation uh, from the third place Zero First Robot Football Club Berlin. Uh, we have Simon here with us, uh, who's already showed us how to run the software to become the third place. Uh, and now he'll talk to us about how it actually works and uh, what their approaches were. Yes, hi. Uh, am I hearable? Yes, we can hear you. Do you want to like switch the slide to see if it works? <laughs> yes, perfect. <laughs> awesome. Great. Um, yeah, I'm Simon Gottlieb. Uh, I'm here presenting the Zero First RFC Berlin. Um, yes, and this is our champions talk, which is kind of misleading because we're third, but ah, who matters? Uh, who cares? So, um, Overview of what I'm going to tell you. Uh, got quite a large uh, time slot reserved uh, to tell you how we became the third out of seven, <laughs> no, out of eight, I think, right? Teams. Um, and right, so I'm going to tell you history. Who are we? A little about our hardware that we used in the simulation. Um, some special notes about our framework, um, the motion. Um, how our motion works, how our cognition works, and the end, small details on our behavior and um, what we are planning for the future. Uh, in general, I'm not saying everything we have done is the best way of doing things, yes, uh, but it's one way of doing things. Um, I think I will point out when I think we did something really smart, and uh, I will also point out if we did things not so good. Um, yeah. So the history, uh, there used to be or is still a team, the Fumanoids at the Freie Universität Berlin, um, but no one is active there anymore. So we founded a new team outside of the Berlin, uh, outside of the university, which gives us the possibility also to include people who are not studying anymore or not uh, affiliated with the university. Um, also, it gives us new freedoms. Uh, we can finally do everything we always wanted to do without justifying what we want to do um, that's a huge huge new huge new room of of playing around with things and trying out things that maybe don't look very um, smart in the first case also because the old team was part of the university from the computer science department there was always a huge focus on software and uh, we always bought a lot of hardware and now we have the possibility to um, to also do a lot more hardware development like motors or motor drivers and so on um, this of course also comes with a downside um, but i will say something about that in a second so we founded the rfc berlin uh, we are currently eight members. They're all listed on the right. On the left, you see our uh, found, founding founding picture of our uh, of our club, of our yeah of our club. Uh, you see a few more people have joined in between, and not everyone is on the picture. Yes. So our goals are independent, cost effective. We have to be cost effective because we have to finance everything currently and of course being awesome and everything is expressed in this picture some of you might wonder berlin berlin geography maybe not so good but aren't you germans and yes we are germans but seriously it would look really really weird if that guy was <laughs> waving a german flag so this picture will and have to do it <laughs> um there's no hidden message in this by the way uh, our oldest platform, this is the last generation we used at the Fumanoids back then, um, is the one that you see on the right. Um, that's developed 2016. We had a different one with smaller robots, 2013. They were quite complicated. They had like a parallel kinematic structure. And with the new turf being this artificial grass, um, the parallel kinematic didn't prove, at least to us, it seemed like not the right way to go. Uh, so we developed back then a new robot that um, follows a very standard layout, I guess, of how to connect the motors and how to how to set them up. And that is also the robot that you see in all the simulations. I think the head has changed since then slightly, but, um, <clears throat> but mainly this is the robot. It says 20 degrees of freedom. 
Um, I think we used four Dynamixel 106, six Dynamixels 64 MX, and 10 Dynamixels 28 MX. Um, the reason we used them is because those were the ones that we had lying around in the lab. <laughs> so we're limited to what we had. Um, otherwise, we, of course, would have put 106 MX everywhere. Um, <clears throat> right. Uh, we also had a custom power board in there for all the power reels and uh, a custom motor board, which would talk RS485 to talk with the motors. It actually had three buses, so uh, we could have high frequency of asking for values without having to increase the uh, baud rate on the, on the bus system itself. Um, that also included the IMU. It also had included the common filter um, for, for orientation directly on, the, on that microcontroller, which allows us, of course, to doing uh, filtering at high, much, much higher, um, <clears throat> much, much higher frequencies than if we would do it on the main computer. And uh, our main computing unit used to be a Odroid X2. Uh, we also experimented with the Odroid, what is it called? I think XU4 or something. No, N, no, XU4 or X4, I'm not sure. Um, but that had some, some stability issues. We don't know. It just always crashed randomly after a few minutes, not even actually after a few seconds. And we don't know why. Um, that didn't happen if we used it over. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, power supply that was like on a socket on the wall, but uh, on our robots, something something odd was going on. So we used uh, the older Odroid X2 back then. Um, now, since the humanoids, the, the way they used to exist at the university don't exist anymore, the robots were given to the Technische Museum in Berlin. So you can actually find these three robots somewhere stored away in the archives in the Deutsche Museum. Also, that robot you will actually find in that archive. Um, I haven't seen that they have been put on display yet, but maybe one day. <laughs> right. Um, so what did we do to bring our robots to the simulation? Um, we didn't have everything detailed laid out. And since we didn't have the robots as an access to, to, to re-measure certain things, we kind of have to do some guessing uh, when converting to the simulation. Um, we, yeah, our robot internally used a description of its kinematic tree and of weights and um, uh, to do the inverse kinematics. And we used that and transformed that into a, to a, um, to, uh, to, to the WebBot's uh, robot description file. Um, I think we also upgraded a few motors. I think all the MX28s got translated to 64s because we didn't want to type in so many numbers. Um, and because we didn't know exactly all the body weights uh, and we, had, we knew that we changed a few uh, things in the foot at the end, making them slightly heavier, which improved the walking. We also adjusted uh, the body weights uh, by hand uh, until we've got the feeling this is the right thing. Yeah, because the issue is we didn't have the real robots anymore. We didn't have the changes. We didn't write it down. Um, so we had to do guessing here. Um, yeah, but at the end we used, we it's still very, very similar. And I think it's fair to say it's close enough to the real robot to be used like that in a, in the, in the virtual competition. <clears throat> Our, the next point I wanna talk about is the framework we are using. Uh, it actually has a quite long history of being developed in different different cycles of states uh, it used to be more like a blackboard system, and then I got more more a, a subscriber publisher system. So we're not using Rust. That's one of the reasons, um, but it has actually a lot of things that are that seem quite similar uh, on the first look. Um, we call our nodes modules, um, which is uh, just a different name for the same thing. And we have something, they have some properties called require and provide. And these, these are can be actually one-to-one -one translated to subscribe and publish uh, in the Rust world. Um, they have almost the same meaning. 
one thing that they were different to ROS is every module doesn't run as in its own process or on thread. Um, they all run in one huge, what I usually call pipeline or layer. And so all the modules being executed at a fixed rate. Um, this has many, many advantages, also some disadvantages. Um, the biggest advantage is uh, we're independent of the OS scheduler, which means that all our modules are, if we replay exactly the same input, we will get exactly the same output. So if you have, for example, I know that other frameworks have similar issues or the same benefits, but if you have like a Rust bag and you have some stored information and run your nodes with it, then the order of your nodes being executed will change every time slightly and you might have different results even though you play the same Rust bag over and over again. And that's a huge advantage in our case. If we replay something that we recorded, we get one-to-one -one exactly the same outcome, which means we can reproduce bugs very, very, very easily and never have to rely on, yeah, maybe that was just a fluke and something and it just happens very rarely. No, if something crashes, we can reproduce it and we can find the bug and, and take it down. And that's um, a huge advantage of this framework. Um, also, everything is running in one monolithic binary, so there are not a lot of programs, so not several programs you have to start. It's very, very easy to manage. Yes, uh, the framework that we used back then was called, I called it module chain because you're chaining modules together. Um, there's a GitHub link. It is probably not what we're going to use in the future, uh, but it is what we used for this tournament. Um, <clears throat> this is a slide slight uh, simplification, a very, very, very simplified version of our of our module chains. Um, you actually see two module chains. You see our motion layer, or what I call motion layer. Um, it is responsible for reading the motor values, basically, doing the inverse kinematics, finding out where should the motors go, and then write them back to the motors. And that's some process that's running with 100 hertz. And then we have a second module chain independently of that, which does uh, everything on the cognition part, yeah, basically gets the image. It somehow magically also gets the current state of the, the robot, of the kinematics uh, from the motion layer. And, um, and then does the object detection, object modeling, some behavior. And then at the end, it uh, has some output that's being magically transferred to the, to the motion layer. And the lower layer runs with 30 Hertz. And the advantage, again, of this synchronous execution, as you can already see it, um, is every, especially in the cognition layer, every of the, every module is being executed 30 times a second. If one of the modules is slower and doesn't perform as well and doesn't reach the 30 seconds, uh, then all modules get decelerated at the same rate. This has huge benefits. Let's say we have some object detection that's very, very slow. And um, if we would have an asynchronous way, then let's say the ball detection only runs with 10 hertz, then all the other modules would run faster, but the behavior can't really, can't really do something useful because it doesn't get the new ball updates, but it's wasting a lot of time by giving many, many new commands and having the synchronous uh, synchronous way uh, takes away automatically the, the runtime of the other modules and give it to the module that actually needs it. Um, otherwise, we will have some modules that just rerun certain computations over and over again that are not required because there's no new information. Um, yes, so that's that's the idea. Um, everyone, is, <laughs> everyone is their own judge to, to decide if that's uh, really what you want or need. Um, the main, the main part, the heart of our emotion is uh, the inverse kinematics that's been was de developed by Lutz Freitag. He wrote his whole master thesis about it. Um, and so it's really, really cool. It supports um, at least the implementation we are using directly in the in, in our code. Um, different task types. Yeah, you can have certain certain um, end effectors that can to can go to specific positions or you can have tasks that they shouldn't go to positions but on a certain line it doesn't matter where or they should go and reach certain planes um, which is i guess very um, easily 
visible for feet. Uh, the first task they want, what we want them to do is go on the ground. It isn't that important maybe where they go. It is, but, but, um, uh, but in a combination with other tasks. And the third, uh, fourth uh, task that we can do, and that's actually one of the coolest one, is the center of mass um, inverse kinematics. So we can say where the center of mass should go, and then it automatically computes um, computes the angle of the of the motors that have to be applied and it doesn't only uh, um, compute the angles the positions but also the speeds. so it's a combination out of both um, the whole the whole software also um, supports different types of joints we can have revolutory joints which are in our robot currently all of them um, it supports prismatic joints none of our robots have i think prismatic joints but it also supports universal joints. This is uh, important for some work that we have done outside of uh, the university and will be important for our robot in the future. Um, if you look at player two in the video chat, you will see that there's a robot sitting next to him. He has a, he has a very complicated neck. And for that, we actually need uh, to solve universal joints. Um, that's important. So this will play a role in the future, will play a role in the future. Um, another thing that we can do is something called hierarchical tasks, uh, which means we do not just solve for one thing and then we solve for other thing parallel to each other, but we can actually uh, put them in a hierarchy and say which one is more important than the other. And more important means that please solve this task first, and after you solve this task, now solve the second task without violating the first task as good as you can. Yeah, Everyone knows that uh, sometimes you have some, some task that cannot be reached, some position that cannot be reached. So you just get to the next best position. And um, the software, the way, and we use this a lot, allows us to, to order them in a hierarchy, a hierarchy and then they get solved inside, nested inside the other task. Uh, it also allows, of course, doing things parallel. That's, of course, also no problem. Um, I want to show you, uh, this doesn't work. There we go. This is a video of uh, a robot arm that we had drawing a straight line. Um, you can see below the straight line, there are a lot of other tries. Um, whoops. Um, you can see below the line, there are a lot of other tries. Uh, this robot arm had huge backlashes, like just more, oh, yeah, he has it in his hands. Just moving this arm has like, uh, has backlash of like 10 centimeters or something. Um, uh, some, but we uh, put in some um, uni, what are they called? Uh, uni, unidirectional limits? No. Unilateral. 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 Thank you. And um, with this, we were able to compensate uh, for even backlashes that uh, are quite huge, especially over such a long uh, lever like an arm. Um, and this robot basically does two tasks. Uh, the first task is stay on the line. And the second task is go to the left point or to the right point. And you can see it's, um, it always stays on the line and, and yeah, moves between these two points. Um, what makes it so hard and why um, this is more than just solving for two points is if we would just go from one point to the other you would see um, not a straight line but you would see a circle line because the motors would the way if you the if you just transform from one key pose to the other there would be a circular move movement you can't really see this in this video but the, actually the arm is slightly moving to the back towards the torso of the robot and then um, moving forward again um, there's another cool demonstration. It's um, the push resist uh, demonstration or, or some variant of it, um, which demonstrates uh, balancing the, the COM, the, the center of mass. And you will see that Lutz will throw the robot forward. And you can see it's actually pushing back with its feet and it's actually really smooth landing on its feet. And then this is, this is really, really cool. I think it's really, really cool. Um, of course, in our in our uh, when we use it at the end, we we tune this part slightly down because it does interfere with other things like walking and so on. Um, but this is heavily used in our robots when they're standing. Yes, yeah? so we don't we do we don't have a key framed. 
idle, we actually have a dynamic idle. I don't know how many teams have that. <laughs> Some have dynamic kicks, we have a dynamic idle. Um, we also uh, tried, we have never finished this um, with the old robots and our team was dissolved. Otherwise, um, uh, yes, and now without a robot, it's really hard pushing this pushing this forward. So we're waiting to take this up again in, in our new robots. Um, here you see the, our first tries in a dynamic kick, and uh, you will see that the robot will lift up its right, right leg. <clears throat> and the, ah, there we go. And the cool part about this is if you look at the robot's left arm, so on the right of the picture, you see that it's stretched out the arm, but we never programmed any task to do anything with the arm. This is automatically happening from, from keeping the con above the left foot, right? And automatically figures out it has to move the hand slightly every time uh, the right foot is moving. And the right foot is uh, being controlled by Lutz in the background with the keyboard. And he pushes up forward or something, and then it lifts the, head, uh, the feet up. The plan was making a done, oops, the plan was, um, how do I? Yes, the plan was uh, making a dynamic kick out of this. Uh, you can see that it still has some trouble with the right arm hitting its own body. That's something that shouldn't be hard to solve, but uh, never got around to it. Yes. This is, I think, uh, the most important parts about the motion. One more thing, our walking is, of course, also dynamic, um, adjusted, but everything else you see from us standing up, the, the robot jumping, uh, and so on, that's all keyframed animated uh, motions. Um, yeah. The next part I want to talk you through is uh, probably the, also the part that has, where the most has happened uh, during this tournament is our cognition pipeline. Um, and there are also, I think, a few nice things in there that I want to point out. Um, but yeah, we'll go we go through it step for step. Um, I guess not everything will take that long. So we start with uh, we get an image. We get an image from the camera, of course. Um, there are now different things that happens, but this is again a very simplified image and somewhere is even a mistake I see, but we'll fix that in a second. Um, so we get the image, uh, we take this image and we create uh, multiple binary image out of them where we just classify if something is green or red, but I will show that in a second. Then uh, we produce something and I think that's something really, really neat and something that's totally um, underused. We create something that's called integral images um, which I'll talk in a second about. These integral images, this just doesn't make any sense. Let me correct this real quick. So uh, we cross that out and that just goes there, yeah, because the color classified image is already created up there. Um, and uh, then when we have this integral images, we can do a few, a lot of, lot of uh, neat operations on that. And using the integral images in combination with the camera matrix or the forward transformation or the camera projection or what you like to call it, uh, we, we do all the different detections. Yeah, we do all ball extractor, we do goal pull detector, we do field contour detection and so on. Um, of course, there at the end, all that goes into some behavior, but that would be like a thousand lines, again, in one module, <clears throat> maybe not the best way of doing it. So the first thing we do is we classify our image, right? On the left, you see the original image. Uh, on the right, you see it classified by colors. Um, these pictures are, by the way, from my team colleague, uh, Michael, uh, from his bachelor thesis. Um, I'm sorry, it's, it's in German, but everyone who can read German for them it might be actually interesting. Uh, he has actually quite a few nice pictures in there. And um, <clears throat> right, so the way we translate uh, this uh, color classified image from the it's a U, uh, YUV picture and we translate it to a yeah, binary picture, multiple binary pictures. And we do this. We do this uh, transformation by using uh, 
the lookup table. Yes, I know that our team in the past did something like uh, they took, I think, the RGB uh, image, or maybe it was the YUV, I'm not 100% sure, but they would set like minimum and maximum values for what is red in all these three dimensions. Um, this has the benefit of being extremely fast. Um, using a lookup table is slightly slower uh, because the lookup table needs to be in memory and being accessed and you have some more cache misses. The hot loop of your code, of course, runs slightly slower, but has the advantage that a lookup table can um, reproduce any, any function that we like. It can be as complicated as we want. Um, as long as it doesn't take the surrounding pixels uh, into account. Yeah, if you do machine learning, it takes the surrounding pixel into account. We do not have that advantage, but it allows us to um, have some different function that translates the picture that does something much, much more complicated. And that's actually what we do. So what we do is we take this, we take this picture and we actually translate it into a RGB uh, y, U, V, and actually I wrote this code and because I don't know anything about color spaces back then, I also translated it into H, S, V, I, and I think I also took uh, the H value plus uh, 100 degrees to, uh, to uh, <laughs> reduce the effect of the color space uh, wrapping around. And some of these, so it's a, it's a 10 or 11 dimensional space. Some of these values are actually duplicates of each other. I didn't know back then, <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but we take this <laughs> 10 dimensional space and then we actually just open up our, our debugging UI, click on, the, click on the picture and it takes like little circles and uh, it knows this, all these pixels in there should be classified green now. And what it does, it, it creates then a Gaussian curve in 10 dimensions and uh, which one of the, of the values are the ones that are furthest away. And that's automatically the threshold. And now we can actually classify the picture from left to right using this Gauss curve, check if the pixel is inside it, check if it's inside the threshold, and then we have the new values. This is actually really, really slow. Uh, so that will reduce like to a few frames a second, but we can create this function process all the all the YUV colors that are out there and create a lookup table. And the lookup table actually only has to run then on a YUV picture and translate it to, to, uh, uh, to a binary picture. Um, yeah. So the idea of having a, a simple lookup table might be this is maybe a lot more appealing than than it looks like on the first place because it allows us to take as complicated functions as we like the <clears throat> binary pictures that we that fall out at the end they're actually multiple binary pictures um, for each each color its own yes yeah, so so uh, the left picture also that you have seen it's not a single picture with all the information, but actually it consists out of multiple layers. This is also very interesting because it allows us to color things that are similar and classify them for a similar things. So for example, our goalposts are white, our field lines are white, and our um, ball is white. But the whites are maybe slightly different. They're similar, but slightly different, and they don't 100% overlap. So it doesn't make sense that certain white colors might be ball and field color, but they cannot be goal pool color because there's no green shimmerish in the, in the, in the goal pool. Um, yes. Right. So let's come to the next part. So we have these binary images, yeah, the color classified images, and now we want to create integral images. So the idea of integral images, uh, I think they called it table sum, some table something uh, comes from Viola Jones for face detection, I think they popularized it mostly. And um, they, and you will see we have actually taken a lot of their ideas and repeated them <laughs> in, this, in this tournament. Um, so the idea is that you, that you create a new new so on the left you see the picture we create a new new table that um, always has the values of how many how many occurrences of this color has appeared until then so for example um, this pixel uh, this value represents how many 
zeros has occurred in this rect rectangle. And this five, for example, represents how many uh, how many ones have there been in this in this rectangle. Yeah, so it always gives us the answer on how many have there been from the top left. Yeah, if we take this one, um, that would be like this box and so on. And um, if you use this integral limit in a smart way, you, we can actually ask for any place in our picture, how many pixels have there been, not just from the beginning. So if we want to know like the yellow rectangle, how many ones have there been, we have to do four XS. We have to ask the five on the bottom right, we have to ask the zero on the top left and the other two zeros and we add the, the zero, these two zeros we add and these two we subtract and then we get the total number of five. And we can see, yes, the rec yellow rectangle has five ones. This of course also works for other rectangles. Uh, they don't have to be squares. My examples are for some reason squares. We wanna know how many ones are there in the square. I again ask the four values in the corner and what's compute five plus one is six, minus three, three minus one is two. And we see, yes, there are two ones in this field. And this allows us, if we have the integral image, to sample any region of our picture just with four memory accesses. And that means that we can also also sample them in any resolutions after having this integral image. And the first time someone suggested that to me, and that was Lutz, uh, I laughed at him because I was like, yeah, that's great. If we have the integral image, then this is fast. But where do we get the integral image from, right? I mean, isn't this super, super slow? But it turns out, no, it's not very slow. I mean, complexity-wise, of course, maybe it's not the smartest thing to do because just accessing every pixel in the picture before you do any processing seems like a lot of waste of time. But since we can go almost go row by row and everything is perfectly in line to memory, we have huge uh, prediction. Uh, so we have huge cache hits benefits also as cache prediction benefits where the uh, CPU already can load the next cache line while processing the old one. And this turns out at the end to be blazing fast. And it's a fixed fixed uh, time frame. So you run it and you measure on the old ride, I don't know, it takes five milliseconds, which is quite a bit, but um, it's just five milliseconds. And you know that basically never changes um, because it's always exactly the same amount of bits. There's nothing, nothing dynamic happening here. The nice thing about having these integral images and having the possibility of asking a single rectangle how many how many colors there are is uh, we can finally do certain processes really really fast and, and in a much much um, much much simpler way. And you will see that I will suggest a few methods now to find a few things that if you have integral images are really simple to do. So one of the most important parts is only analyzing parts of the objects that are inside of the field contour of our of our of our view, right? So we do not want to process anything that's outside of the field because anything could be there. There could be people with holding soccer balls in their hands, or there could be other robots, or there could be the neighboring field with a with another goal pool and another game setup and so on. And we don't want to we don't want to find the ball on the other field. We don't want to play to these wrong goals. So or I think most teams, the one of the first things they do is try to find this field uh, field contour. Um, you can see in this debugging image already, um, it's already highlighting the field contour, it already found it. Uh, and in our debugging tool, we uh, dim down the brightness. Um, so the developer can actually focus on what's being processed in the other modules. The way that the tour is working is, um, is similar to this. Actually, the precise implementation is it's slightly different, but um, this is a good image to, to, to visualize what's happening. Um, you can see on the left, I hope you can see, there are like a lot of um, red rectangles, right? Um, they should be processed, actually they should be spawned in, in the height of the, of the horizon. Yes, uh, this is not the case in this picture because I think it used it used pre-recorded images back then that didn't have uh, camera information, but in general, that is what should happen. 
And um, so we spawn these red rectangles and we can just, we just can lower the height. Yeah, we just go down until, and here you can see, so the first red rectangle is being found here again, the second one is being found here again, and so on. You can, it's not, not that visible, but um, then that one is here and that one is there. And we just lower the top part until, so we take the whole red rectangle, we check how many green points are in there, then we reduce the height, and then we count again. And we do that until uh, we, we are losing green pixels. Right, and um, we can accelerate that actually quite by quite a bit by instead of just going pixel by pixel down, we can actually do a binary search, just have it, check if we lost something, then go in the upper or lower half, and we can basically do a binary search on the field contour of our <clears throat> of our picture. Um, this is added by um, some noise that we're allowing, so we're saying like yes, but if you lower it by the half. And uh, there are thousand pixels that are being lost, but um, but there are only five green pixels that we lost. So like a few percent, then we're saying yes, it's still valid. Yes, it's a green pixel that's um, outside outside of the field. That's fine. And um, so the field contour detection now is really really fast. This doesn't even take a millisecond to process, um, and that's actually really nice. Um, the same idea we're using for uh, the gold pool extractor now. Uh, so we are applying it slightly different. So we go along the field contour and then we spawn like a lot of, I don't know if you can see this, a lot of like gray rectangles and they're checking, is there something white? Is there something white? Is there something white? And if they do detect something that's white, yeah, like here you see in the middle of the, of the field, then actually it goes up and tries to um, follow Follow the goal pole above the above the horizon, and if it can do that, it's a goal pole. If it can't do that, it's not a goal pole. Um, this picture is taken out of the simulation. I uh, took it. I have taken it uh, yesterday, and you can see that uh, our color cal calibration is not perfect. There are some green pixels missing here. Um, because of that, the field contour is not perfect, and that also maybe explains a few. Uh, issues that we have during the game, why our robots wouldn't always uh, go to the ball. <clears throat> um, yeah, it, it, the, the downside of this detection method, of course, is it would never detect the goal pool behind this robot. Um, and because of that, and the way the, our whole uh, cognition works, it never knows if this is the left pool or the right pool, so we'll always will do some guessing there. And at some point it always messes up, messes up which one is the left one and the right one, but that's okay. Yes. Um, the <clears throat> this algorithm was developed for um, for for the white ball, um, but the performance on the red ball is incredible. So the red ball detection before that was written by me, and um, I'm very ashamed of it. But still, I'm gonna tell you. Um, so the red ball detection before that uh, would use scan lines. Right, uh, we would just scan the picture for red pixels, and because I'm a really smart guy, I'm like, hey, not every pixel I have to check, so I'm only gonna check like uh, every every uh, eight pixel. Yeah, and I would calculate how how big would be the ball, and so on, and uh, then I would dynamically jump to the next pixel. And it turns out, with this technique, we could only look like for three meter distance, and after that, the processing power we would just run out. With this new approach of using integral images, we have completely new new possibilities. Um, and and what we can do is it's really simple. We can actually just look in the integral image on the bottom right and just check if there are any red pixel in the picture. And if it says no, we don't have to do any processing at all, right? That's like a huge win on on everyone's side. And because in a lot of pictures there are no balls because of looking to the goal pool or falling down or whatever. If there is the ball, if like if we have enough red pixels that there could be a ball in the picture, we can do a binary search again. We will uh, check if in this field there is a ball, and if we lost any red pixels, and if yes, we lost them, then we would jump back, and if we didn't, we would uh, continue halving our 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 box. Right, and then we would probably jump here, 
and we would click, okay, there's still red pixels. And then we would go another left and then we'd check, oh, there are no red pixels. And then we would pull the left side to the right. And we do the same with the top and the bottom and it's a binary search. So this is like incredible fast. Like this again, takes even faster than the field contour. Um, finding the red ball like this is so, so, so easy. Sadly, we didn't play with the red ball anymore, but <laughs> we finally had the solution for for this issue. Um, all right, so now we have to make this work for the white ball. And this is uh, slightly more complicated because there are a lot of other white things on the field. Uh, we always voted against it, but um, no one was, no one was uh, for keeping the ball red. And so before doing the ball detection itself, we uh, built something what we call a white blob extractor, uh, just extracting white blobs because any white blobs could be anything at the end. So and the way we do this now, we have the integral images, we can do binary search. And now there's a, another smart step that we put on top. It's, um, it's someone wrote something. Apologies, yes, uh, no worries, no worries. Um, so, uh, so the way it works is we do uh, also a binary search, but this time for white, but the boxes that will result are very, very large. Now you see this is a really big, large red box. And the next step we do, it, uh, we divide it in the middle, right? We divide it in the middle, we, we alternate, alternating uh, do a vertical or horizontal split. And in this case, we do a vertical split. And then we have two new boxes and then we shrink those boxes. And we do this over and over again until we result in a very fine boxes and fine leaves. You can see on the top right where only the leaves are shown. You can see all the white blobs in the pictures are encircled or, or yeah, in boxes. And um, after having these, um, some of them are small. I mean, there is a termination criteria when they're too small, but in general, we target for something that's smaller than the ball. And when they're too small, we start to joining neighboring uh, boxes again, together again, and then we forward only the ones that are roughly the size of the ball. And uh, then you see in the bottom left, uh, bottom right, uh, the, the, the candidates that we give forward to the next um, layer. Normally, um, or very often something like this would also be included. Um, that's very, very typical. Um, and this particular example didn't happen, but yes. One of the downsides you can already see is it doesn't encircle the ball perfectly. Um, it's only partially in there. That is um, a bad thing for machine learning applications. Um, and this may be a big downside and maybe this has to be tweaked in a different way that it actually has more of the ball and maybe some, some surroundings of it. I think a lot of machine learning uh, application actually depend on, on knowing and being able to see the form of the, of the object. Um, this is basically what falls out. These are all white blobs that would be detected by a white blob detector. Um, and you see that very seldom the actual ball is on it, um, but very often uh, parts of the ball is on it. And now we need a, need a second step that actually classifies, is this white blob a ball or not? <clears throat> uh, the, the, the original implementation of uh, Michael Puhach um, was using a classification called the KL divergence the Kulbach life, oh, I forgot the name, it doesn't matter. You can Google it, it's, it's fine. Um, just... Thank you, thank you. Um, and the, this is a very simple statistical analysis of um, comparing two, two distributions. So what we do is we pick some, we pick some of these positive examples of the ball, and then we uh, translate them into for resolutions, and then we take these pixels and compare them to a reference ball that we have taken a picture of before. So we take a reference ball, or we take multiple reference balls, and then we go through all our new candidates and check are they are they color-wise statistically similar. And uh, we we use different uh, resolutions to cut down a little on time. So we first would take a 
for pixels are roughly the same as in the other ball. And very often uh, it turns out, no, they're not because there's something red inside or blue inside or something like that. And so they can be dismissed. And But if they're similar, then we go to the next resolution and then we go finer and finer until um, we are if it's a ball or not. This did work really well actually in, um, in the real world. And it also works really well if we have a ball that has very, very slight color in it. So if there are like a few red dots or a few blue dots, this works really, really well. Um, this doesn't work, and it works really well if we have the ball in beforehand, then we can put it in front of the robot, click on one or two balls. This is always what we do. We, we have one, two, or three samples. So the training of this uh, divergence is uh, very, very easy. Um, but it's not very robust, so we have to redo it in front of every game. And we change the we change the rules, and now we have like these five or six balls with different lightning conditions. And um, maybe you remember how good does this work? Um, this is the game against <laughs> CIP brains. They didn't do a lot, and we didn't do a lot. Uh, the problem is our pipeline. This approach does not work for um, changing colors and having so many balls. It only works if you exactly know the ball and if there's some color in the ball. That is a big downside. Um, what we have done and developed, I'm going to skip over this now time-wise. I have written a blog article, article about this. Uh, we applied AdaBoost, which combines different weak learners. Yes, in our case, the weak learners, we used two things. We used still the Kyle's uh, divergence for this. But we also use the HAR-like features. Um, this is a very traditional way of uh, applying the <clears throat> Viola Jones uh, applications of weak learners and HAR-like features. The only thing that's new, the way we do it, we also use the Kyle divergence. But we had it at our hands, so uh, that was very easy to do. Um, and yes, that's already uh, worked a lot better. Uh, you can see our goal in action it detects the ball, maybe slightly a little too early, but it's even a white and black ball. Uh, and after the games, after we fixed this, our robots finally again did something in the competition and uh, we're competing again. All right here on the right, you see a few balls that like, like run through the pipelines. Um, they're already classified by the robot, which one is the ball and which one's not. They're just symbolic. It has nothing to do with the scene on the left. <clears throat> yes. Um, last, not last part, but uh, behavior. A few words. Our behavior is very simple. Uh, we're uh, throwing out four roles. Striker, supporter, defender, goalie. The striker goes to the ball. The supporter, he stays right behind the striker having the ball always inside in one meter distance. The defender tries to stay in the in their own goal area, basically, and the goalie tries to stay in its own goal and jumps from time to time if required. The goalie is fixed. It's always the goalie. Striker, support, and defender um, decide which roles they take based on their perceived distance from the ball. And this does actually um, have a few downsides. This is not a very sophisticated way of doing it. Um, maybe you remember our scenes of our robots doing this. Yes, they uh, play with the goal pool and they play with the goal pool until they fail. And the annoying part about this is the robot is telling the other robots, I have the ball, I'm directly in front of the ball, please don't go there. And all the other robots may be in the field playing and seeing the ball will be like, okay, I'm going gonna, I gonna to take one meter distance because <laughs> the other one will go. And um, so there's a lot of things we can and should improve um, to do this. One easy thing to do would actually try to use like something like a team ball to fix this. But if you look very closely into the skiff, you actually see two robots playing with the goal pole. So even this type of fix would not <laughs> solve this, uh, this <laughs> issue. Um, yeah, <clears throat> right. So this is like the past. And there are a few words of the future of uh, the RFC Berlin and our robots that I think Lutz would like to say. Uh, thank you so much for everything you said before. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> the future, we are, Sam has mentioned it, we are not affiliated to any university anymore, which means we essentially don't have any funding. And uh, as with most uh, kid-sized teams, um, robots are expensive, actuators are expensive, 
um, thankfully, the actuators that uh, Robotis produces now change in their shape and varieties, and they have a lot more affordable actuators out there, which you wish to have access to then back in the days. We don't. And even the cheap ones are not exactly what we could afford in the long run. Um, so we needed to make robots of ourselves, preferably big robots, because, you know, swag. And but now we have uh, one robot assembled. It's only mechanically uh, assembled. Both electronics are still a uh, work in progress. Okay, turn it on. I'm going to find the on switch. There it is. Um, yeah, it's actually running Windows 95. And uh, what's special about it is like one meter in, in height. Uh, it weighs less than eight kilograms. Most of, most of the hardware is actually 3D printed. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, let me turn the camera over. Um, but the hardware is actually 3D printed, which is kind of interesting. What we learned when we made the last model with the humanoids was uh, that we played already with uh, 3D printing. Like you cannot really um, transfer designs from metal structures to 3D printed structures. But since you have all the freedom in the from the 3D printing world, you could. This is. Uh, a piece that goes into the can you see it piece that goes into the upper leg. Um, this is I don't know this weighs like two hundred grams, and it's dead solid. This compares very well to the rigidity as you would get it from aluminum parts or metal parts for the matter. And most of the parts in the robot are actually designed in this fashion. They are rather solid, like twenty percent infill. Uh, super lightweight, super sturdy. We're very pleasantly surprised by what you can get out of three three D printer. And the remainder of the parts, like the, the torso, is mostly hollow. There's uh, a lot of supporting structures that are intertwined, screwed together by a massive load of screws. Um, this turns out to be surprisingly sturdy as well. Okay, it's a bit short. Simon, do you have the picture of the parts of the robot at hand, by chance? Um, no, I don't. I'm on a different computer right now. I'm sorry. Uh, anyways, imagine this to be mostly solid. Um, another benefit of 3D printing is uh, having multiple parts that make up the robot does not come at a great cost. If you need to machine your parts from metal, every individual component, every individual part is like a pain to, create, to produce. With printers, it's fairly easy. I think in the head alone, there's like 30 parts that need to be printed to assemble it. It's super sturdy and nice and uh, easy to assemble, even though it consists of a, a ton of things. Uh, but this does not come with a cost. It uh, gives us the ability of creating rigid structures that are more rigid than you would expect from a printer. And yeah, overall print time of this thing is a bit over two weeks, I think, like if you would have a single printer running nonstop. Um, one thing that Simon has mentioned earlier is the kinematic structure where we uh, diverge from the standard layout. I hope you can see it. Let me turn on the additional lights. Yes, there's a special construction, the head, uh, the way that it works for the universal joints that we will finally need. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, it, it has a speaker. You heard it before. <laughs> Yes, and you can always you can always follow us, of course, on our we will write a blog where we always update, and we have a Twitter account which we always update. Uh, we don't have Instagram, I think. Um, oh, yeah. and we'll try to keep you updated on our progress on our robot. Um, what I wanted to show is uh, because of uh, money saving reasons. We have employed a lot of uh, servos, as you would find them in the model world, RC servos. And those are dead cheap. And they don't provide a lot of torque, right? But uh, on the, at the cost of range of motion for each individual actuator, you can mechanically create some sort of lever to increase the force applied on each joint. This is what we did in the head. There's two motors in the, in the head itself, which can tilt, the head in either direction, they work in conjunction, and they form a, a loopy kinematic structure. It's kind of hard in terms of inverse kinematics and forward kinematics to estimate the actual angle or orientation of the head with respect to the torso with that. But this is what we have, why we have the fancy inverse kinematics for. 
this thing can actually solve it. In the lower head, we have the same two actuators down here. They can actuate the lower neck, which is super hard if you do it by hand. But you get the idea. Um, we, what I want to show is um, we can use rather cheap actuators and by, have some, by having some uh, mechanical tweaks, sort of levers, we can uh, boost the performance of them at the cost of range of motion, but we don't really need a lot of range of motion here. So any lever in our benefit is what we want. Um, and this reduces the cost dramatically. Like the actuators that go in, in the lower neck, we, including the custom electronics we have made to, to drive them, they come at about 25 euros, maybe 30 euros a piece. In total, we have 30 actuators in this robot. Two of them are stronger. Those are the ones that go in the knees, which are kind of not really visible. But here is a, a strong one, which is rated at uh, about six Newton meters. We overpower it a bit, so we should get 10 Newton meters out of it. And yeah, that's um, most of it. In the ankle, you can also see this push rod structure as we have it in the neck. Can you see it? So again, depends on how you actuate it, you might get into this uh, deadlock situation. Um, this is pretty neat. It offloads the uh, radial forces that could be applied to any joints, like the classical mechanical structure of a, an ankle joint with two actuators, which are in the ankle itself, which where the actuators, the servos axis is the joint, which means every force that is applied on the, the joint axis will be transmitted directly to the servos axis. And they tend to break at this particular point. If we could reinforce this, this joint by any means or make it cheaply replaceable, then we would win. This is what we did. We have just a carton joint here and everything else, uh, the carton joint can consume a lot of, uh, of force and everything else is um, indirectly driven. So this should save us a lot of trouble with the, with the servos. Anyways, our RC actuators are annoying because they cannot do a lot. And to make them, to turn them into something comparable to smart actuators, as you, as you know them from kid size, we made a lot of electronics ourselves. This is the custom, the current driver board that we are developing. This uh, goes into the, the hip here. There's uh, three more going to be into the torso. Um, this board can drive six motors, six RC motors. So what we do is we buy RC, RC servos, remove the internal electronics, hook this thing up, and then each of those boards can drive six servos. And you get the same thing as with uh, dynamics and motors. Like you can ask them what is the current value, you can tell them to drive anywhere. And um, yeah, as Simon has be said before, since we don't have any constraints by any professor or university or whatever party, we can reinvent the wheel as much as we like. Uh, we did quite a lot of things here. So there's, there's each board, they're all connected in the robot, right? And each board communicates the current state at about one kilohertz rate to the main computer. And we can guarantee that each data that's being, that's being acquired on each board uh, will be delivered to the host software no, with no delay more than two milliseconds, which is like ridiculously fast. But we, we had the chance of doing this, so we opted on, on doing it, realizing it. And everything is USB enabled. So you can just hook up your host computer and configure it. Thank you very it. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That's really, yeah, really cool. I'm excited. And, uh, yeah. I'm excited seeing it in action too. <laughs> are there any questions in general from anyone? I think I think we are yet now, uh, we've got our 50 minutes full. <laughs> Maybe some people want to ask some stuff. <clears throat> Do you have a, a time frame? Do you think that you will be able to participate in the next German Open or World Cup with this robot? Uh, last year, uh, March. It's uh, it always takes longer, and um, it's currently a lot of um, electronics are not available, so we have to design around them and so on. That makes makes it a lot lot harder. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Mm 
so we are not we're not participating this year uh, in the Robo Cup uh, on site because obviously our robot is not ready and it's it's since we're also not all students anymore but also do other things <laughs> uh, the the amount of time we have actually on spending it is smaller than before but uh, we're planning we're planning on getting this we we we, we this robot gonna play soccer like no what no matter what. Do you think that integral images have a future in computer vision? Because like a lot of people just moved away from them to neural networks because processing power is much greater and with uh, now small GPUs also being able to run relatively complex neural networks at, at like 30 frames per second. Does it really it's a it's an interesting it's, yeah it's an interesting question so uh, in general i mean neural networks we always use for stuff that is kind of hard to decode or encode and um so for detecting signals that are not clear for us but we do not use uh neural networks for sorting stuff right we not be like oh yeah, i have a list of integers and i want them roughly sorted i'm gonna do that with a neural network we engineer that right and we have really fast algorithms to do that and um I don't know, but to me, it seems like this white blob extractor, uh, the way it finds the white blobs is quite, quite fast. And this will not be beaten by any uh, neural network in any ways. But at the end, I still have these uh, candidates and they need to be classified. I don't really see how to do that without neural networks. So even if we use integral images and even if we use such tree structures, we will need uh, machine learning at the end for something. So we will not get around that. But I'm hoping that we can reduce the amount of machine learning, amount of data that we have to deal with um, before, <clears throat> yeah, before it goes into the machine learning part. And one motivation back then also of doing this was when we doubled the field size, uh, we were really afraid of uh, not being able to detect the field uh, the ball in a very far distance because the ball is only a few pixels large. And the integral images actually do allow us to go on really high resoluted uh, pictures with high resolutions. Um, and I think that's not doable with neural networks at all currently. Um, so I think there is still another, another, another few years that this might actually be a good path. But if it's still the way to go in 10, I don't know. Do we have any other questions? Uh, oh yeah, there's a question in the chat. Um, why use the X, uh, Odroid X2 among the many single board computers out there? Uh, back then we used the X2 because um, we, it was, I think was the most powerful one when it came on the market and uh, was one of the first that we could get up and running with exactly what we wanted. Um, so there's, um, I think, no particular reasons besides someone introduces, introduced it to the team. And since it's by stats the most powerful one, why change a running system? And there's another question about your framework. How do you uh, ensure the deterministic timing? Do you have a real time Linux kernel? Um, and is the order of execution? Um, of the small steps within the modules ensured? Yeah, so um, we don't use a real-time Linux kernel, but we don't need that because um, every module is basically a class that has an execute function. And this execute function is in some list and being executed. And all the modules are being executed in the order they have their requires and provides, right? So the first, first modules only provide stuff, so they're gonna be executed first. And then the next module maybe requires the image. So it only be being executed after the previous module that provides the image is being executed and so on. So they, they, they built a chain and then you have like a, not a tree, but a graph that um, where you can do a topological order. There are no, there are no cycles inside. And uh, if we need cycles, we do some, some, uh, some magic to, to, to make them non-cyclic, um, yeah. <clears throat> And then another question about the robot, what material did you use for the 3D printing? Yeah, that goes to Lutz, I guess. Um, let me jump in. Uh, it's OPLA. It is uh, OPLA. 
It didn't break yet. I'm, I'm pretty surprised. So I used the same material for my robot doggle. Uh, that's my doggle. And apart from some components that are kind of designed to break, which are like super tiny gears, it just works. This thing is like two years old, a bit more even. All right, thanks for the question from the chat. Thanks for, to Lutz and Simon for uh, giving us a detailed presentation of uh, their, their team and uh, their software and hardware.